Thank you. The first item of business is portfolio questions. In order to get in as many people as possible, as usual, if I have short and succinct questions and answers to match, then I won't need to intervene in anybody and we'll all be happy. Uh, question number one, Liz Smith, please. Ask the Scottish Government how many farmers have received payments under the National Basic Payment Support Scheme since August 2018. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, by the 9th of November, over 13,200 farmers and crofters across Scotland had received their National Basic Payment Scheme loan payment worth uh, more than three... Sorry. Uh, just a minute. Thank you very much, Mr Lyle. I'll ask you again and we'll... Uh, are the microphone certainly on. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, sorry, could you begin again? Uh, yes, thank you, Presiding Officer. By the 9th of November, over 13,200 farmers and crofters across Scotland had received their National Basic Payment Scheme loan payment worth more than £308.6 million to the Scottish rural economy. The first loan payments arrived in farmers and crofters' bank accounts on the 5th of October. These loans were made available almost two months earlier than the start of the 2018 CAP Pillar 1 payment window, which is set by EU regulation at 1st of December, and also before any comparable loans of or advances were made elsewhere in the UK. I would encourage every farmer or crofter who has yet to take up the Scottish Government's offer of a National Basic Payment Scheme loan to consider so doing. Thank you, Liz Smith. Uh, can I thank uh, Mr Ewing for a helpful answer. Uh, given the fact that obviously many farmers had to use their uh, winter fodder supplies in the summer months due to the exceptionally dry conditions, what assurances can the Scottish Government give uh, that farmers will be well supported should we have a bad winter? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member makes a very fair point. That they, we all agree that uh, the weather uh, this year has been exceptionally bad. First of all, exceptionally wet with snow and then exceptionally dry. And these have caused real difficulties of which I'm acutely aware, uh, having had many discussions with farmers. Uh, and that's precisely why we did respond uh, with setting up a weather panel and providing other modest assistance to, to farmers. Uh, uh, I know that farmers are extremely resilient and they themselves, uh, working with the NFUS uh, and other bodies, have done a, a number of measures to themselves ameliorate and tackle the problems in the availability of fodder, for example. But we are most certainly keeping a watching brief on all of these issues. And our main task, of course, is to ensure that insofar as we are able to do so within our powers, the administration of the support payment scheme is, uh, is done as smoothly and effectively as possible. And that really is why I'm very pleased that the loan scheme, which is really an advanced payment scheme, uh, provided assistance to farmers, in Scotland, farmers and crofters in Scotland uh, earlier than anywhere else in the UK. Uh, so uh, we will continue to review that, and I do so on, frankly, a daily basis. Alistair Allen. Presenting officer, is the Cabinet Secretary able to establish what the take-up of the loan scheme is among crofters specifically to ensure that they benefit from it as much as other groups? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, overall, there has been an extremely high take-up of the offer of loan, um, but I, I would take this opportunity uh, uh, presented by Dr Allen's question to say to any farmer and any crofter who have not yet made application for a loan payment, please do so. It is still possible to obtain that payment. At most cases, provided uh, the individual uh, farmer crofter unit is eligible, and in most cases, the loan will be available at 90% of estimated entitlement, uh, and that is still available. So I would urge uh, uh, any remaining crofters uh, to take uh, up that opportunity and I will specifically check with the Stornoway ARPID office uh, to make sure if there are any further local measures that we can take following up the raising of this matter by the local member. Question two, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the rural parliament which is being held in Stranraer. Minister. 
Uh, the Rural Parliament, which is being delivered by Scottish Rural Action, aims to really empower rural communities across Scotland and by giving them a stronger voice to initiate change at a local and national level. And the Scottish Government has supported this voluntary organisation since its inception in 2014 and has enabled three Rural Parliament events to take place. And the last one in my home city of Brechin. I'll be at the Rural Parliament uh, later today and tomorrow and on Friday the Scottish Government will be represented by the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business and Constitutional Relations. Mike Russell. Uh, the uh, timing of this event is timely because we have Brexit ever looming and in the run-up to this event SRA have been engaging the underrepresented voices in our rural communities about the future of rural funding and policy post-2020 to make sure that their voice is heard and we've been happy, the Scottish Government has been happy to support that work with £25,000 from the Brexit Stakeholder Engagement Fund to make sure that people in rural Scotland have had a say in this process. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will be aware that Stranraer and the Rins and other parts of Dumfries and Galloway share uh, many of the challenges that other parts of rural Scotland experience. What assurance can she give us that the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency will work for the benefit of all parts of Dumfries and Galloway and represent all parts of the South Scotland region and ensure that more events like the Rural Parliament are brought to the area along with the associated economic benefit? Minister. I, I can give my absolute assurance to the member that that is the case because that is the, the purpose of the, the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency because it has a clear focus on place and it will have a vital role in driving growth across the region as a whole uh, because the agency will de deliver a tailored approach and really try and look at the very particular opportunities and needs of the whole of the South of Scotland region looking at how we can support businesses, really strengthen communities and drive the economy forward. Uh, we really have tried to engage widely in our plans for the new agency and we know it's absolutely essential that we keep that ongoing engagement with stakeholders uh, to try and drive that work forward. Now when the, the new board will be chosen to provide a balanced mix of relevant skills and expertise and uh, we aim for that to be representative of across the south of Scotland region and of course we now have in place the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act so we will be working towards equal gender representation on that agency also. Question three, Rona McCann. Thank you, President. To ask the Scottish Government how its Food Tourism, Act, Tourism Action Plan will aim to support producers. Cabinet Secretary. The new Food Tourism Action Plan, Food Tourism Scotland, is a unique initiative which will align our tourism and food and drink sectors to double from £1,000 million to £2,000 million in value, the amount that visitors to Scotland spend annually on food and drink. There will be a number of specific actions to support this, such as supporting our top 100 visitor attractions to get our Taste Our Best accreditation. This is Visit Scotland's Quality Assurance Scheme and Local Sourcing, and working to get all our major events showcasing local food and drink. This work and much more will directly benefit our local food producers and manufacturers as we seek to make Scotland a good food nation. Rona Mackay. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will know the key role that Scotland's chefs play in promoting Scotland's food at home and abroad. As we mark the Year of Young People, will the Cabinet Secretary join me in wishing our Culinary World Cup team, the youngest team in the competition of over 100 teams, the best of luck in Luxembourg later this month? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'm delighted to uh, uh, welcome uh, the efforts of the Scottish Culinary World Cup team and they've carried out a great job in recent years in ensuring that our food is highly prized, presented and championed both at home and abroad. Uh, and I wish Robbie Penman and his highly skilled young team uh, every success in Luxembourg at the end of the month and have no doubt that they will do a great job of further raising the profile of our fantastic produce to help Scotland's aspiration to become a global food tourism destination. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Regional Food Fund, established in the Scottish Government's um, ambition of 2020, uh, has awarded so far grants to 15 collaborative projects that are designed to promote local Scottish producers. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what direct economic benefit these grants have had on uh, local producers and tourism, and ask if there are any plans to uh, expand the scheme further? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I, I believe that these and other, um, uh, other events have had significant benefit. Um, we do promote uh, our food and drink at a national event at Glen Eagles biannually, 
Uh, and as a result of the success of that event, I decided that the regional showcasing events uh, should take place. And we're having a variety uh, of these. And the first ha have already taken place. And there will be an analysis of our estimates of the value of these products made in due course. And the member will appreciate, and I know that she's experienced in this sector, that uh, some of the benefits take some time to come through. Uh, I mean, if you're a local producer and you win a contract with a supermarket, for example, these things take time to develop. Business relationships take time to build up trust and, and to come through. So uh, the analysis isn't necessarily something that can be produced uh, in a matter of a few months after the event. Uh, but the Glen Eagles event have been spectacularly successful for the companies involved. And I will share what, what information I can, as I always do, as soon as, it possibly, as, as soon as we possibly can, presiding officer. Question four, Brian Whitfield. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to ensure that farmers have access to public procurement contracts for food. Cabinet Secretary. Since 2007, we've seen a 41% rise in the proportion of locally sourced produce within the public sector. This has seen more and more, 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 and more farmers and other food producers supplying our public sector contracts, such as those provided by Scotland Excel. We want to see more of our local produce being served in our schools, hospitals, prisons, uh, and other public uh, uh, bodies, and facilitate this through a range of measures, such as the supplier accreditation program, regional showcasing, which I just mentioned, and the expansion of the Food for Life program. Brian Whittle. Yeah, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, Moskill Farm near uh, Mochlin is leading the way in organic milk production, uh, also having done away with plastics in favour of bottling their milk and supplying local businesses, restaurants and cafes. However, they told me that it's next to impossible for local suppliers like him to make any headway with the public XL procurement contract. The 69% of food supplied in that contract coming from outside Scotland. I'm sure the Cabinet, uh, Cabinet Secretary would agree that that is unacceptable. And if he does, what can he and the Scottish Government do to support our local food suppliers yes. and simplify the public procurement process so yeah, local let's get food to questions, and make it please. to a school dining hall? Mr Whittle, let's get to questions. Uh, um, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm, I, I understand that 100% of fresh milk used across Scottish schools is Scottish Wiseman's Graham Dairy. So already there, there is a Scottish supplier of milk to our schools in Scotland, and I'm pleased about that. Uh, Mr Whittle mentions another supplier, and if he cares to write to me, I will look into the circumstances of that particular company. So far as Scotland XL, which he, he mentions, is concerned, Scottish XL are now requiring a Scottish price within their groceries and provisions uh, framework. They do this by having a secondary price list for products only with a country of origin of Scotland. Uh, d definitions of this uh, of country of origin of Scotland and manufactured in Scotland are now included within the Scotland XL frozen uh, tender. Uh, and uh, having met with Scotland XL, I've heard of the excellent work that they do. It is difficult for small businesses to break into public procurement. That's why we have a supplier accreditation program. That's why in the, in the 2014 legislation, we have specific provision to encourage small businesses to be able to get onto procurement. It is still not easy in some cases. It needs to be a relationship built up with local authorities and other public sector bodies. Uh, and that takes time and it takes input from all sides. But I'm delighted that we've made very significant progress with more and more Scottish produce being provided to our school children, our patients and hospital workers and across the whole public sector. And that work continues. Rhoda Grant. In spite of that, it's very difficult for small producers to supply, say, their local primary school or indeed health centre. I'm wondering if this is something that the Cabinet Secretary could bring forward in a Good Food Nation bill. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> well, there's, there is no need to, to do that. The work is already underway and is in train. The Food for Life programme is extremely successful. And indeed, I think Mr Whittle mentioned it a fortnight ago in respect of uh, East Ayrshire Council. Uh, we have a programme of 400,000 to extend the good work to all other local authorities, and that will be done over a period of years. Um, and there are many, many examples of great success of relatively small businesses uh, or medium-sized businesses in supplying um, food to schools around Scotland. Um, a, for example, Swanson's Fruit Company in Inverness supplies local sourced fruit and veg to schools across the Highlands in the, uh, in the region that uh, the member 
uh, represents. McWilliams Butchers in Aberdeen supplies meat to schools in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. Corrie Mains Farm in East Ayrshire, all the eggs to primary schools. Fenton ba Barnes Farm in East Lothian, 40% of poultry sourced by the NHS. So many companies do and are succeeding and we're doing a lot of work and we don't need any further legislation to do this. We just need to get on with it and that's what we're doing. Question five, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the fish processing industry in the North East regarding training workers to make best use of exiting the CFP. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is in regular dialogue with the seafood processing industry regarding the many challenges facing the sector as a consequence of Brexit. The loss of freedom of movement, providing opportunities for people from the EU to live and work in Scotland is key. And given that over 70% of the seafood processing workforce in North East Scotland are non-UK EEA nationals, the processing sector has every right to be concerned. The UK government has failed to provide clarity and certainty for people already here and working in fish processing and in other industries. And that has been compounded by the recommendations of the Migration Advisory Committee for Future Immigration Policy and all serve to reinforce why Scotland should have full control over immigration powers. Maureen Watt. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very full answer. On the 2nd of November, North East politicians attended one of the regular North East Fisheries Development Partnership meetings at the new Peterhead Fish Market. They were shown the new training space in the facility, which Tory MSP Peter Chapman welcomed on the basis that it would help replace foreigners working in the industry with local youth. Mr Chapman was reminded at the time that the Fisheries Development Partnership has an equality policy and that his comments were out of order. Does the Minister agree that all discussions over the future of the fishing industry, especially in the context of Brexit, must be conducted in a way that does not discriminate or stoke xenophobia? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I do agree with the sentiments which Maureen Watt expresses. People from across the European Union and indeed beyond have made Scotland their home. They have enriched our communities, especially our rural communities. Uh, they bring, in many cases, a strong work ethic, family values and a strong sense of community spirit. I, I think we are very fortunate to have them give of their effort and time to work in Scotland. Uh, and therefore I entirely endorse what the member says. But don't forget, 70% of those working in the North East in the processing sector uh, come uh, from EU countries. It's very difficult to see how that sector would be unable to continue to be successful without the excellent contribution that uh, these welcome residents in Scotland uh, perform. Question six, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to mitigate the potential impact of the closure of the Cairngorm Funicular Railway on the area's economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the safety of passengers at this time is paramount. The Scottish Government continues to work closely with Highlands and Islands Enterprise to mitigate any economic impact. HIE and Business Gateway are supporting local businesses that might be affected, including offering one-to-one -one advice and access to loan funding where appropriate. A funicular response group has been established to oversee the operational and communication needs relating to the closure. Richard Lyle. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Tourism plays a significant role in our economy, with winter sports being of particular importance to the rural economy. Can the, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what has been done to develop further opportunities for the Cairngorms and other winter sports facility and what help is being given to reopen the railway as soon as possible. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can assure the member that uh, HIE is working flat out on these matters and I myself am in touch with their, uh, with their staff uh, on a very regular basis. And I know that, for example, uh, they are about to receive a report on the, the potential problems facing the funicular. That report should be available at the beginning of December. They are also working on ensuring the availability of snowmaking equipment in early December and hopefully operational uh, as soon as possible uh, thereafter. Uh, and they're working hard with the local community representatives uh, in order to ameliorate the problems posed 
by the loss, temporarily, we hope, of the services of the funicular wayway to ensure that there is skiing taking place on Cairngorm this year as soon as possible and to the maximum extent as possible. And we are absolutely determined to make those efforts uh, bring as much success to the area possible because the funicular railway and the Cairngorm mountain is essential to the success of the local economy of Badenoch and Strauss Bay. And thank you. I regret I've been able to call Angus MacDonald, Alec Rowley and Neil Bibby in this set of questions. We have no time in hand. I have to move on to the next set of questions on environment, climate change and land reform. Question one, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the expected demand will be for the incineration of waste following the ban on sending biodegradable waste to landfill in 2021. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to the waste hierarchy which promotes reduction, reuse and recycling of waste as the preferred options for waste management. Statistics show that we now recycle more than 60% of waste from all sources. We do, however, recognise that incineration is a necessary part of the management of residual waste if we're to reduce our reliance on landfill. We have commissioned a waste market study to better understand the current and future markets for the disposal and discovery of biodegradable municipal waste including the energy from waste market and to understand the implications for the Scottish waste system of alternative disposal and recovery options once the ban comes into effect. We will have a clearer picture of key issues including likely future demand for energy from waste facilities once the report is completed. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Correspondence sent to me by the Cabinet Secretary suggests that we are going to see a seven-fold increase in waste incineration capacity in Scotland in the next three years. Given that these facilities require continuous waste as feedstock, what will be the impact on recycling rates and the waste hierarchy? And isn't it now time that we see a moratorium on new incinerators in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have to ensure that we are able to manage the waste that is produced. And I would remind the Chamber that this is about residual waste. I would encourage everybody in this Chamber um, and in the country to ensure that as little residual waste is actually produced uh, um, uh, and ends up in, in this fashion. Um, we, we need to deal with the landfill ban. Uh, incineration is going to be a, a key part of that. There is an issue about managing re incineration and um, in managing it once we get over that particular uh, um, period where uh, it is needed most. And, and that is what the, uh, the, the study that I referred to is going to help us get a handle on. Um, there is an issue. There is undoubtedly a, a concern uh, there is, however, a, a situation to be managed, and we are doing the very best we can to manage it correctly. Maurice Gould. Uh, thank you. I refer members to my register of interest. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined that the SNP solution to the ban on landfilling biodegradable municipal waste is to construct an extra 1 million tonnes of incineration capacity. This seems absurd. So will the Cabinet Secretary outline what non-incineration treatment options are being considered and how does the Scottish Government plan to support them? Cabinet Secretary. I've made it clear that incineration is, is not what we are supporting uh, as if that was the only thing that we are doing. Um, I want to really emphasise here that this is about residual waste and what is really important in all of this is that we reduce the amount of residual waste that there is in the first place. And that's the, the real uh, focus of what this government is doing. Alec Rowley. To be a pick and mix across local authorities, some have four bin collections, some have one bin and then they're recycling it. Is there best practice and is the Scottish government looking at best practice in order to try and advise authorities on the best way forward? Uh, there second. is indeed a household recycling charter, which actually, uh, I think at last uh, uh, I looked, about 26 out of the 32 local authorities have signed up to it. Um, they don't, of course, aren't, of course, able to switch over overnight uh, to uh, a uniform system. But that was agreed between the Scottish Government and COSLA. And I would be very happy to update Alec Rowley uh, on some of the detail around that uh, and indeed on some of the more uh, specific questions I've been asking recently about where we are with each local authority's adherence to it. Question two, Andy Whiteman to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it or the Grouse Moor Management Group has made of the environmental impact of hill tracks constructed on open moorland. Minister. 
The Greismoor Management Group was established in November 2017 and its remit was to examine the environmental impact of Greismoor management practices such as muir burn, the use of medicated grit and mountain hair calls and advise on the option of licensing grouse shooting businesses. Now, there have been no requests to consider the environmental impact of hill tracks. It's for planning authorities to consider the environmental impact of individual hill tracks on a case-by-case -case basis when determining planning applications or prior notification. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Minister for the, her answer. The Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform approved the Cairngorms National Park Plan in 2017. It contains a presumption against new constructed tracks in open moorland. The problem is the authority can only properly implement this presumption over the 25% of the area of the park that is a national scenic area. Given that IUCN categorises both national scenic areas and Scottish national parks as Category 5 protected landscapes, does the Minister agree that both deserve the same leg level of regulatory control? Minister. Uh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm aware of the members' concern around this issue, and I know that some of the issues around this were discussed at the, as part of the amendments to the, to the planning bill in the recent local government committee meeting. And I would say that I think all of these concerns can be addressed uh, when, we, when the Scottish Government looks to uh, consult on the permitted development orders, because I, as the member will know from the Minister for Local Government's response to him when the amendment was discussed at committee, the Scottish Government has committed to carrying out a review of the General Permitted Development Order after the completion of the planning bill, uh, where he said in his response, we will consider calls for changes to permitted development for private ways alongside other proposals for change, and any proposed changes will be subject to full public consultation. Gail Ross. Thank you. Can the Minister outline the steps that led to the introduction of the Grouse Moor Management Group and what action the Scottish Government has taken to tackle wildlife crime in recent years? Minister. Uh, thank you. I am to answer the member's question, I mean, in 2016, we were faced with a number of reports about tagged golden eagles going missing, which led to claims and counterclaims about what was happening. Now, the Cabinet Secretary then asked SNH to commission uh, an analysis of all the data to see if there was any suspicious pattern linked to that. And what emerged from that report was a shocking finding that up to a third of tagged golden eagles had gone missing in suspicious circumstances, and many of them were in clusters uh, on or near grouse moors. And it was that finding that led to the decision to set up the group led by Professor Werity to examine whether we need new regulation of Grousemuir management. And alongside Professor Werity's work, the Cabinet Secretary also commissioned a research project to examine the costs and benefits of, to Scotland of shooting estates. Now, uh, Professor Werity's group is due to report back in April, where we will see what recommendations are made at that point and if any improvements can be made. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And the, the Minister will know of the revived coalition report um, in, on um, uh, Grassmuse. And, and I would seek reassurance in view of the wide range of concerns that have been expressed, both in relation to the planning bill and um, uh, Andy Whiteman's amendment, and also um, uh, to me uh, from constituents, uh, that uh, surely um, it would be possible for the remit of the, of the Grassmuse Management Group to to be expanded to look at this, and then that would feed really well into what I welcome as the review of the permitted development rights. Minister. I thank you. I suppose my only concern would be that if we were to add that at this late stage, that it could slow down the, the progress that has been made so far in the group. And I do think that we will have the opportunity to look at the permitted development orders once we've had the completion of the planning bill. Now, I, I'm well aware of the, the report from the Revive that was launched last week. I also met with, Scottish, uh, with Environment Link this week as well, who conveyed their concerns to me about hill tracks. But that, the consultation on that and will be coming after the planning bill. We have the commitment to do that and we will consider all the issues surrounding permitted development rights and around hill tracks at that time. Question three, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what issue it expects to be given priority at the UN Climate Change Conference in December. Cabinet Secretary. The Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework on Climate Change, or COP24, will take stock of global efforts through the culmination of the Talanoa dialogue process, which the Scottish Government has contributed to and will seek to agree the rulebook for how the Paris Agreement will be implemented. I plan to take Scotland's positive messages on climate action to COP24 and to show the world that our low carbon transition demonstrates that deep emissions reductions are achievable and that these can be delivered in a way that promotes sustainable and fair economic growth. 
Following a personal invitation from Patricia Espinoza, the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the First Minister also plans to attend this year's COP, subject to any urgent parliamentary business and indeed the ongoing mess that is Brexit. And this is further confirmation that Scotland's experience remains highly relevant to the rest of the world. Julian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And obviously she agrees with me that it is essential that Scotland not only is represented as a nation at these global events, but they continue to be leaders in the global effort to fight climate change. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, indeed I do. Um, the government, I think as most people know, is committed to international cooperation. We engage regularly with partners overseas to share our successes and to learn from others. Adopting new, more stretching emissions reduction targets puts Scotland amongst a select number of countries who have committed to translating the Paris Agreement into domestic law. We also remain the only country in the world to have statutory annual targets matched by a comprehensive package of stretching and credible on-the-ground delivery measures as set out in our climate change plan. Question four, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the forthcoming ban on burning of plastics on farms, what contingency plans it, it has should the market approach to recycling farm plastic not work? Cabinet Secretary. The relevant amendment to the Waste Management Licensing Scotland regulations was actually made in 2013 and a group was established in autumn 2016 uh, to plan the transition towards a position where the ban could be enforced. This had membership from National Farmers Union Scotland, SEPA, uh, Zero Waste Scotland, Scottish Government and several waste plastics collectors and reprocessors. The transition to full enforcement has therefore been carefully considered. In most areas of the country there are recycling collection services available and I'm advised that since the announcement the network has expanded and that is one of the reasons why a transition period until 1st January 2019 is in place. SEPA has published clear guidance for farmers to help them decide how best to dispose of plastic waste and there are also local SEPA offices across Scotland that can provide more direct assistance. Rhoda Grant. Um, I have been contacted by crofters in rural Scotland and on, in our island communities saying that there is no recycling facilities local to them. There is a concern that the only option they can take is to bury those plastics which will have a knock-on effect to the environment and indeed to animal health should they become um, unburied. I wonder if she would consider working along with local authorities to see if they could recycle along with their normal household recycling. I, I think we would want to have conversations uh, uh, where necessary. Um, a list of plastic waste service providers is available on the Zero uh, Waste Scotland website, so I'm not sure whether or not access to that would be helpful in these circumstances. If all other options have been exhausted, and I think we would need to make sure that all other options had been exhausted, uh, and there is really no recycling service available, then uh, the waste can be sent to landfill at a licensed site or to an energy from waste plant. However, this should only be considered as a last resort. So I think that we would want to have uh, some serious conversations first to ensure that there isn't actually a, a, an alternative solution. I have three members wishing to ask supplementaries. If you ask short questions and I have succinct answers, I can take all three. Otherwise, I won't. Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much. Following on for Rhoda Grant's um, concern, these are clearly concerns expressed by constituents in Orkney. Would she uh, undertake to, um, to ask SIPA to complete a, an island impact assessment so that we can explore the options which either involve uh, landfill at the moment or potentially one or two ferry journeys to get plastic away? I, I am conscious that there is an issue particularly on islands uh, in terms of uh, um, the, uh, the transport issues. I, I'm happy to discuss with SEPA uh, whether or not the, uh, the request uh, uh, by the member is appropriate and I'm happy to speak to the member about the uh, particular circumstances that he might wish to raise. Some of what I answered in respect to Rhoda Grant may also be applicable uh, in respect of the member's constituency. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and declaring an interest as a farmer. The government agreed to hold a number of stakeholder events supported by an engagement programme in order to support farmers' transition to the requirements of the ban. How many events have been held? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I don't have a note of the precise number of events. I do know that there's obviously been a clear amount of uh, uh, discussion, uh, and that uh, group that I read out the membership of uh, um, has been involved in that, and that includes NFUS. Um, so uh, I will uh, undertake to make sure to, to uh, get not just the number, but the locations of any uh, such meetings uh, and ensure that uh, the member, and indeed any other members who wish to know that, uh, if they would contact me, um, can, uh, can see whether there was one locally. Colin Beattie. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that we must continue to work on reducing the amount of plastic used in all sectors and industries? And can she confirm that farmers will have time to prepare for the ban ahead of it coming into force? Cabinet Secretary. I've already um, prioritised action on plastics and we will continue to do so. Um, I, I think most members uh, uh, will know the, the work that's already been done in respect of some of the single-use plastics and is planned. We do support EU plans to tackle single-use plastic and ensure all plastic packaging is easily recycled or reusable by 2030. We're a founder member of the Plastics Pact. Uh, our commitment to a deposit return scheme signals a step change in our ambitions. Uh, and I can confirm, as I indicated in an earlier answer, that there has been a, a transition period until 1st January 2019 to allow farmers time to prepare for the ban. And I do invite members who have local uh, uh, farmers or indeed crofters or anybody else who has sp specific concerns to flag them up to me uh, and we will see what we can, uh, we can do. Question five, Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action the Environment Secretary is taking to enable people from deprived areas to access woodland areas. Minister. The Scottish Government recognises that access to woodlands in deprived areas does Im improve people's lives and we've committed around £1 million this year to woods in and around towns which is a programme that tackles the barriers to accessing woodlands and the current programme for government supports Europe's largest green space project the Central Scotland Green Network which this year will receive £950,000 to support woodland creation with a particular focus on deprived communities and furthermore the National Forest Estates Investment in urban woodlands includes over £5 million at Cunninger Loop, which supports the regeneration of deprived communities in the Clyde Gateway. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the uh, Minister's response, uh, particularly given that tackling health inequalities crosses all portfolios. Um, is the Minister aware that the green networks of urban woodlands have been found to bring value of £14 million per year through recreation and health benefits, as well as contributing to the network of carbon sinks? And given the Minister's previous answer, will the Minister work with the Minister for Planning to actually set a target for urban woodland expansion to ensure that these spaces and their benefits are accessible to people across Scotland, particularly those for whom travelling into the country is much more difficult? Minister. Oh, I want to thank the member for that for that question, and I would agree with her that I mean this is an issue that really crosses all portfolios. Uh, earlier, in one of my first official visits, I went to Jupiter Artland in Edinburgh, which was in relation to a fund launched by SNH for six hundred thousand pounds, really aimed at getting children and helping children, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, to get in and uh, experience uh, experiencing nature and into our woodlands. I mean that's what I do think that all the projects there are so many positive uh, projects and initiatives that are taking place uh, by a number of organisations, by our national parks, and we recognise the issues that there are uh, around travel. And if we look at some of the work that's been done by Woods in and around towns, I mean, in 2017 and 18, they had over 520 events and activities, and 14,000 people attended those, and they were from areas of deprivation, which include uh, Castle Milk, uh, Craig Miller, and other, other areas in Glasgow's East, uh, East End. Uh, they also had Scottish Forestry Grant Aid to bring 1,000 360 hectares of sustainable woodland management for public access and 7,600 metres of footpath upgrades and eight, nearly 9,000 metres of new footpaths. So there's a whole raft of positive work that's going on there and this is work we want to encourage and further develop. Question 6, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on SEPA's investigation into the Mosmoran petrochemical plant. Cabinet Secretary. Unplanned flaring at the Musmoran site remains under investigation by SEPA as an independent regulator. SEPA does provide updates where it is able to do so through the Musmoran and Brayfoot Bay section of its website. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. I, I had understood uh, from uh, previous statements by SEPA that actually the report was to be concluded this month. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could clarify whether that is also her understanding and also clarify whether that report will be made public as will be the case with the joint SEPA route and branch review with the health and safety executive. Uh, and again, if you could clarify that when that final reports, uh, and we don't know when that will be, if that report will be made public so that my constituents can assure themselves of their safety. Cabinet Secretary. Both regulatory authorities are fully aware that local communities do want to be kept informed about what has been happening. SEPA's investigations into the unplanned elevated flaring that occurred at the Mosmoran facility in 2017 and 2018 
have been ongoing and are at an advanced stage, SEPA have been clear that the evidence gathered during its investigations cannot be made public because this could compromise any potential enforcement action. SEPA have not committed to publishing a report, but has provided updates at local meetings and working groups, as well as publishing information on its website, including on the enforcement actions it has taken to date. Aspects of this work are being jointly carried out with the Health and Safety Executive. We expect the joint SEPA and HSE review into the site to conclude this month. And in respect of safety issues, HS HSE will consider what can be made public and when as a result of its work. Yes, I'm sorry, I have to conclude questions there and apologise, James Kelly, Kenneth Gibson and Kezia Dugdale, as there is no time in hand and we have to move on to the next debate as that concludes the portfolio question.